Good evening. Can I welcome you to our Thursday Bible study? Um, it's me taking you today on the theme, the names of Jesus. And tonight we're going to consider the name Bridegroom. Bridegroom. But before we consider it, let's commit our meeting to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to again study your word. We thank you for your word. Lord, we marvel when we hear recently that it's now been translated into 700 different languages. And we thank you for that. But we pray that as we look at it now, that you would open its meaning to us, that we might not add anything to it or subtract anything to, from it, but rather the whole gospel might be preached and go forward. To the honour of your Son, we pray. Amen. Well, in studying the bridegroom, we're going to read from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 14 to 16, sorry, 14 and 15. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. Then the disciples of John came to him, that is Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. A short passage, I'll read it again. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So the bridegroom. Jesus calls himself the bridegroom in answer to a question. Well, we all know what a bridegroom is. The man getting married... The woman getting married is the bride, the man is the bridegroom. And many of you will have been either a bridegroom or a bride in the past. It's an expression, when one is a bride or a bridegroom, expression of love when one is getting married, of eternal love, of never-ending love. So to understand this further, we're going to consider four groups of people that Jesus were talking, was talking to. The people who came and asked the question, the questioners, the Jewish people, the ordinary Jewish people who would be around, Jesus' disciples, and then ourselves. The questioners, the Jewish people, the disciples, ourselves. So let's consider first the questioners. Now, this question was the third in the series, and we see those in Matthew chapter 9, and we see it in Mark's Gospel as well. The first question was asked at the healing of the paralytic. That's the man whose friends took him on a stretcher to Jesus. They took him up the outside of the house onto the roof. The roof was opened up, and he was lowered down to Jesus' feet. And when his Lord to Jesus' feet, Jesus turns to the man and says, Your sins are forgiven. And then we read in verse 4, But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easy to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk. So Jesus was posing the question, Which is easier? To say, Your sins are forgiven, or rise and walk, because they firmly believed that only God could forgive sins. Then Jesus explains, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. So what was Jesus was showing here was that by healing the paralytic, he could also forgive sins. So that was the first question which was asked. The second question comes in the next part of the passage in chapter 9. We have the calling of Matthew first and then 
They came to Jesus in verse 10, as, as Jesus reclined at table in the house, many, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They didn't like the fact that Jesus was with tax collectors and sinners, not with the holy Pharisees. But Jesus' answer is very, very clear. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So a physician goes to the sick. And likewise, Jesus came, said, For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. It was sinners that Jesus came to earth to help. And then we have the third question. The third of these questions, it was actually asked by the disciples of John, but ah, really, you can see the Pharisees were behind this. They were the ones who stirred them up. They were the ones who lit the fuse and stood well back, waiting for a big explosion. And they got the disciples of John to come along and to ask the question, we fast, the Pharisees fast, why don't your disciples fast? Well, Jesus' answer to John's disciples was really very, very gracious. Very gracious indeed. And it's not the answer we would possibly initially expect, because you'd probably have expected that Jesus would have said, yeah, my disciples should be fasting a bit more, perhaps so many times a month, perhaps so many days a week. But Jesus doesn't. doesn't refer to the subject of fasting at all. Initially, instead he refers to this issue of the bridegroom. Why? Well, in John's Gospel, in John chapter 3, we find out why. John chapter 3 in verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with you across the Jordan, that's Jesus, to whom you bore witness. Look, he's baptising and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from above. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is now complete. So John was telling his disciples he wasn't the Christ. He'd come to lead the way, to open the way, to prepare the way for the Christ. And then he says very clearly that Jesus is the bridegroom and that he is standing beside the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So John was the one who called Jesus the bridegroom first. Now, going back to Matthew's passage, when the John's disciples came to Jesus, it's almost certain that by this point of time, John had been arrested. We can't pinpoint exactly, but it's almost certain. And so Jesus was very gracious to John's disciples. Very gracious in that he was using John's words. He didn't tell them off. He reminded them about who John considered Jesus to be. So that's the first group of people, the questioners. Let's consider the second group of people when Jesus claims to be the bridegroom. And the second group of people are the Jewish people, the ordinary Jewish people. What did they think about this reference to the bridegroom? What did the bridegroom signify? What was its meaning? Well, 
Many of the Old Testament prophets had referred to the bridegroom. Isaiah had, Jeremiah had, Ezekiel had, Hosea had. And if I turn to a couple of these references, the ones in Jeremiah, for example, in Jeremiah 2.2, 2, Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Your love as a bride. The bride was the Israelites, the Jewish people, the nation of Jews. And by implication, the bridegroom was God. And again in the next chapter, in chapter 3 and verse 20 of Jeremiah. Um, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband. So you've been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. A treacherous wife. Again, God is the bridegroom. The bride are the Israelites, the Jewish people. But Jesus says that he is the bridegroom. Now consider this. To the Jews, the bridegroom is God. But if Jesus claims to be the bridegroom, does that mean that Jesus is now claiming to be God? The bridegroom. Who is this Jesus then? Now that is the most fundamental question right throughout each of the Gospels. Who is Jesus? Is Jesus God? And each Gospel writer wants the readers of the Gospel to start asking that question. Indeed, a classic example in Luke's Gospel when the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, after the storm, they turn round to each other and say, Who is this man that is power of the wind and waves? Who is this man? Who is Jesus? And the Jews here must have considered God was the bridegroom. The Jewish nation is the bride, but Jesus claims to be the bridegroom. Who is Jesus. Now there are in the Gospels other messianic parables where Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom but we're not really going to consider these and the reason for that is this incident which happens here comes right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in chapter 9 verse 9 Jesus is calling Matthew as one of his disciples. It really is right at the beginning of his ministry that this question is asked. The other messianic parables about bridegrooms come right at the end, in the last week of Jesus' life. There's two classic ones. The uh, parable of the marriage feast where invites are given out to the bridegroom's wedding. The bridegroom representing God's son. And many don't come, so the people are invited. So that's a parable of the uh, wedding. The other one is the parable of the ten virgins, where the bridesmaids have all got their lamps, and uh, some of them have enough oil for when the bridegroom comes, some of them don't. But both of those come right, right at the end of Jesus' ministry. As this comes right at the beginning. But for the ordinary Jewish person, they're left with this question. Who is Jesus? Is Jesus claiming to be God? Is Jesus the bridegroom? So, we've looked at, first of all, the questioners, John's disciples. We've looked at the ordinary Jews. Let's consider Jesus' disciples. What is the is Jesus saying to them? Well, when asked the question, Jesus doesn't talk about the need to fast and so on. Instead, in verse 15, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast. Jesus instead 
talks about the time when he'll not be with them. So what he's saying is they have got to appreciate the time he's with them because the time will come when he won't be there. Now consider you've probably been to a wedding at some point in time as a guest. If the bridegroom or the bride comes and speaks to you at the wedding, maybe there's a gap in the reception between the courses of the meal, maybe it's after the meal, maybe it's at an evening if there's a band dance or something, maybe they've made a point of coming around and speaking to you. It's quite flattering that they come and speak to you. It makes it quite memorable and special. You value that contact with the bride or with the bridegroom. And they press the flesh as the, exam, as the uh, phrase is. Well, Jesus is saying to the disciples here, they should rejoice, they should value the time he has with them because the time will come when he won't be there. And the Jesus, the disciples find this a hard concept to follow. So further on in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16 and verse uh, 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying far be it from you Lord this shall never happen to you Peter couldn't accept what was to happen to Jesus and that Jesus should leave them and then again in chapter 17 in chapter 17 of Matthew's Gospel and verse 22, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they considered the future, Jesus' disciples were greatly distressed. They didn't like the prospect of this. And that is what Jesus is preparing them for. For the fact he won't always be with them, that he will be leaving them. Now, this brings us to the application. Because the application of this passage is surely that we should appreciate Jesus while he's close to us. That we should mourn, we should be sad and distressed when he's not close to us. We should desire a spiritual closeness to Jesus. This is what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. And that is without doubt the application from this passage. So, the question is, the Jewish people, Jesus' disciples, and now finally let's consider ourselves. Let's consider ourselves and what Jesus is saying to us. Um, let me ask you a question. What were you doing at 20 past 11 on the 29th of July 1981? I'll give you that again. What were you doing at 20 past 11 on the 29th of July 1981? Many of you would have been watching television with 750 million other people throughout the world, watching in 74 countries, watching the marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. Now, we know the outcome of their wedding, of their marriage, how it all went disastrously wrong. How it ended in divorce and a lot of ill feeling and acrimony and but on their wedding day it was totally different. On their wedding day there was a great feeling of excitement, great anticipation throughout the whole country. The heir to the throne was getting married. The Queen's son was marrying. 
Most of us have never seen anything like this before. There's tremendous excitement, tremendous anticipation. And you'll probably remember the dress when she stood out of that carriage. You'll probably remember the kiss on Buckingham Palace balcony. You probably remember the Archbishop of Canterbury referring to it as a, a fairy tale wedding. But all that was just the wedding of a man. How much greater would be the wedding of the Son of God? And we say this because there in Revelation, in chapter 19 of Revelation, we hear about it, Revelation 19. And verses 6 to 9, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult, and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. For the marriage of the Lamb. And the Lamb is undoubtedly in revelation of the Lord Jesus. He is to be the bridegroom. Now, the only thing here is, we're not specifically told in Revelation who the bride is. There's great implications, but we're not specifically told in Revelation. To find out the answer, we have to look in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 25, we read, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And in verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This mystery refers to Christ and the church. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. When saying the church, it does not mean some great political institution. It does not mean a building. The church? No. It's God's people. Christians. It's us. We are to be the bride of Jesus. So, we've considered each of these four groups, each of these four groups of people that Jesus was speaking to. The disciples of John, the Jewish people, his own disciples and ourselves. The application of this came out in the section when Jesus was talking to his disciples that they should appreciate, really appreciate the time they have with Jesus. Spiritually, they should desire to be close to Jesus and the application is that we should desire a spiritual closeness to Jesus. He is the bridegroom, the church, we are to be the bride. Amen. Can I remind you that after this you have time to make a quick cup of tea. Lovely. And then if you look, go on to the Zoom, you'll be able to have a time of prayer with the rest of the church. Thank you.